Last time on Step Back U.S. History, we looked at all sorts of different indigenous civilizations that existed in what would become the United States. And now we're going to pick up the series like over a year later. What we're going to talk about today in the context of U.S. history is freedom and culture and how indigenous society conceived of the role of the individual and what they could do, as well as European culture, what their concepts of freedoms were, and then use it to explain why so many libertarians became fascists after 2016. Hang on with me on that one. Oh boy. I can already feel the negative comment energy radiating from this video coming back in time from the future like tachyons. Oh, do I really want to say tachyons in a video? Yes. Whatever. Racists can get f Let's do this. Now, we're not quite at the Columbian Exchange yet, but when Europeans eventually did meet indigenous people in those very early conversations, a lot of Europeans wrote about how indigenous people lived in a state of total freedom. They wrote about how groups like the Haudenosaunee, which they called the Iroquois, had no servants, had very little to no slavery, and no concept of people being more or less important than others. At least that's what they thought. It isn't as true as they like to make it out to be, but, you know, they're projecting their ideals. At least some people. This story began to change as Europeans became more and more desiring of indigenous people's territory. All of a sudden, these carefree, free people were barbaric and oppressive. There was a common idea that because hunting in Europe was considered a luxury only for the very, very wealthy, that the men who primarily hunted in the indigenous societies that English settlers uh, found first, there was this prevailing rather ironic idea that indigenous men oppressed indigenous women because they just went out and hunted for fun all day while the women were forced to do all the farm work. And a lot of Europeans, some of those same Europeans, would consider the indigenous people barbaric because their society was free. They both commented on how beautiful their freedom is and about how dangerous and terrible their freedom is. That they were barbaric because they had no government, even though they did, and that somehow they were too free and in doing so had no respect for authority. Meanwhile, those same Europeans were trying to make the claim that they were passing freedom down to indigenous people. So how can you be giving freedom to people you have determined are too free. This is the discussion we're going to have to have, and this will explain how Europeans at the eve of European conquest conceived of freedom. They even considered slavery a better state of existence than the kind of freedom that indigenous people enjoyed. So what was indigenous society? What was their social relations? And how were they considered, quote unquote, too free? Well, this one will come up quite a bit because it comes up a lot in American history. They had a different concept of slavery. I would think that uh, the attitude towards slavery would be a pretty good litmus test about how your concepts of freedom and autonomy and individuality all play out. Now, the buying and selling of slaves would be completely alien to an indigenous person living in the eastern portion of what would become the United States. There also was not a concept of racialized slavery that somehow the skin color you had had some sort of role in what your status of servitude would be. That racist idea was developed by people in North Africa, developed by Europeans, especially the Portuguese, until this strong ideology to justify systems of slavery and oppression and racism would get imported over to the Americas. This was still developing in Europe. We'll get to Europe. And also that whole idea of developing racist ideas, that is a whole video in it itself. That being said, several indigenous societies did practice some forms of slavery. Slavery existed in a very small scale. Those who were enslaved were usually members of other tribes that were captured in war. Also in lieu of a currency, oftentimes in games of gambling, selling uh, periods of your servitude was a desperate thing to put in for uh, a game of chance. And in times of desperation, times of starvation, sometimes indigenous families would put younger members of their family and temporarily sell them into servitude for uh, the necessities to live or 
sometimes so that those people could go to somewhere where they could get the necessities to live. There's oftentimes something you might consider slavery, which were forced adoptions, which was a way to spiritually replace a family member that had died. Oftentimes they would capture somebody and replace them with the spirit of the person who had passed away. Interesting fact about that is that once European diseases started to destroy the populations of these indigenous communities, entire wars would break out called mourning wars to get more captives to keep up the numbers of your own tribe. Many times the people who were captured in war were hostages and were working in servitude until they could work out some sort of ransom with the other tribe, usually for people who had been captured from their tribe, and make the exchange. Sometimes though, people who were enslaved in such a fashion would be assimilated into the tribe they lived in, and they wouldn't spend their entire life in ownership and servitude, they would eventually become members themselves. And that's a really big important thing to understand about indigenous concepts of what the you know, unit of existence was. The nuclear family as we conceive of it today wasn't really a thing. We talked about this in the previous video, but concepts like fatherhood had less of a strong emphasis than this connective kinship group that was often matriarchal. Now, independent thinking and being your own individual was a thing within many of these indigenous cultures, but oftentimes that will was secondary to your tribe, your kinship group. This is one of the things about indigeneity and the idea of indigenous belonging that Europeans didn't quite get because many Europeans see belonging within a group as something that is done through blood. You know, you have to be directly related to somebody to be worthy of being related to them. While indigenous people saw a more loose version of kinship, and that blood is actually not as important as being accepted and belonging and being a member of the community. So things like the amount of indigenous blood you need to have to be considered indigenous is a very European concept that was imposed on indigenous communities by Europeans as they started to create new statuses for indigenous people. What it did is it actually injected patriarchal ideas into their culture, and on top of that, completely messed up the way that indigenous cultures govern themselves. It's also why when white people claim indigenous ancestry, it doesn't mean anything, especially when it comes to belonging and having true indigenous status through the eyes of indigenous people. This is why the Elizabeth Warren situation where she claimed Cherokee status for a long time was extremely insulting to Cherokee people. Either way, there was a strong emphasis on belonging and connectedness between people within these kinship groups. So oftentimes people judged each other on idealized models of one's social role and spiritual role within their society. That being said, it doesn't seem indigenous people thought all that much about concepts like freedom and liberty. That is, until Europeans started taking it away. Once Europeans were trying to enslave, displace, and commit genocide on those people, then a whole new language about freedom needed to be developed and develop a dead, but we'll get to that in a future video in this series. Now, Europeans had a very different concept of how society should function and what the roles of the individual and the collective were. These ideas go all the way back to Greek philosophers like Aristotle, who had a whole idea about liberty that we'll get into in a second, and even some contemporary thinkers of the period. The Europeans right before the settling of the Americas were getting into what would be called the early modern period, and the Middle Ages were nearing their end, although still highly influential. But anyways, the idea of what we think of as freedom with individual autonomy and private property is actually a fairly modern concept, one that Europeans did not have. Europeans tended to have very different concepts of what it meant to be free. There are two main ones that I'll get into. One is a medieval concept that is actually a very distinct and very defined concept. This being a very medieval concept that freedom is a particular set of liberties for a very small subset of people that was usually given to you by a royal decree. These are things like your right to self-government, the right to practice a trade, or possibly exemption from taxes. This is what freedom was for a lot of Europeans. One concept that also comes from the rise of hardcore Protestant sects is that freedom doesn't mean the freedom to do what you like or the freedom of the individual, but it meant freedom from sin. Who's in the house? 
Jesus in the house. And in that concept, freedom means not so much being able to choose things as it is strictly adhering to the teachings of Jesus Christ. This kind of freedom, to live free from sin, meant to have a deep knowledge of your role within society and to play that role to the utmost of your ability, to know that you have a rank on the hierarchy and that is what you need to do and be happy with it. Because everyone from the lowliest peasant to the highest king were subservient to a higher power. Which meant that servitude actually reinforced this idea of freedom rather than was you know mutually contradictory to it. So what was European society on the eve of conquest? Well, it was not a place of religious tolerance or religious liberty. The ideals of European culture were order and discipline. There was no religious freedom as you'd think of it today. Every state had a state religion and not adhering to the state religion meant that you were free to be persecuted by the government. Many Europeans believed that religious unity in a state was important for societal cohesion. And Europeans went through a lot of violence to uphold this ideal. You might know about the Thirty Years' War, the war that nearly destroyed Europe, or in the UK where the tension between Anglican and Catholic rulers led to unrest and violence through a huge chunk of their history. Things like private religion were virtually unknown. Society was also extremely hierarchical. Inequality flowed through virtually every single social interaction one person experienced within a day. You know how much it sucks talking to your boss or your landlord? Well, imagine that everybody Everybody you met was either above you and you had to talk with deference or below you where you could be cruel. The highest authority were kings who believed they ruled through divine mandate, that God literally willed them to rule their country. And economically in Europe, about 5% of the population controlled 100% of political power and wealth. And I thought millionaires and billionaires were bad. The society was so hierarchical that it was literally a crime to disobey your boss. This wasn't just applicable in the realm of economics and politics, it was also personal. The society was also intensely patriarchal, where men dominated over their wives and their children. In Britain, there is this idea called coverture, where a woman, when she got married, legally lost her entityness as a human and became more or less an extension or property of her husband. This domination in the European family unit, very different from the indigenous one, as you can probably tell, was literally compared to the divine rule of kings and that women were told to serve their husband just as a noble should serve the king. So with that being what European culture was like, this is what was coming across the Atlantic to free indigenous people. This is the concept of freedom, built upon admittedly, that led to the American Revolution and the freedom and liberty that the United States was founded upon. So what does that have to do with why so many libertarians became fascists? Well, I guess I'm gonna have to do something weird and talk about why freedom is a bad word. First of all, before we start, hashtag not all libertarians, Emperor Tiger Star would get mad at me if I didn't point out that there are some people who are considered left-wing libertarians, although most of them today would just consider themselves anarchists. And yes, I'm using libertarians in the sense of the far-right ideology because they more or less own the word now. This also isn't gonna be a detailed breakdown of libertarian ideology because I have a series on ideologies that I will definitely need to talk about libertarianism in for a new episode in that at some point. But now that we've talked about European ideas of freedom and libertarians often idealize the founding fathers and the founding documents of the United States, which were much more influenced by these medieval ideas of freedom than uh, say a modern person in our society. Hence why the libertarian ideas of freedom are so uh, nonsensical. But if it is, people live on farms, have been drinking raw milk since the beginning of time. It's normal and healthy, it tastes better. Libertarianism, as we know it today, was founded in response to the civil rights movement. They were against things like desegregation and uh, civil rights laws in general. Some even going as far as to saying we need to bring slavery back, and I'm not kidding on that one. But yes, when you break down where libertarian thought comes from with neoclassical economics and the idea of inequality being baked into their concept of freedom. You can then understand why with the emphasis on the freedom to segregate, the freedom to enslave, 
and radical free market hierarchical concepts of how the world works that it doesn't take that much of a nudge to know that their idea of freedom is very different from one that you or I might conceive of. And it really only takes a hop, skip and a jump to push into radical racial supremacy and all that kind of fun stuff. Now, I'm not saying I don't like freedom. I think freedom's fine by my definition of it. But of course, what it means, and oftentimes you'll see this on the internet because the internet is a horrible place where no one should ever talk to each other, that uh, the idea of freedom is basically empty. On the internet, we basically only have arguments about semantics. And I feel like freedom, when it ranges all the way from borderline fascists and the right-wing libertarian movement to anarchists, the exact opposite of that, uh, you can see that freedom has basically lost any and all real meaning. And I think that to understand libertarianism, you need to know that idea of seeing freedom as knowing your place in society and performing it to your utmost ability, which is an idea that definitely fits into a fascist idea of how to see society. Oh man, I really don't want to read the comments on this one. So now, since people complain a lot, we're going to enter the opinion zone. This is where I'm going to make a legit take that comes from deep down in my little black heart. So cover your ears if you don't want to be poisoned by my postmodern neo-Marxist ideology. One of the things that I think this discussion of freedom and hierarchy and societies means is that the idea of someone being able to live their life as they see fit, you know, as long as not hurting people, is virtually impossible with a society that practices forms of hierarchy. And just like when the United States was founded, just like in Europe before the conquest of the Americas, and I would argue even today, the idea of freedom, the idea of the autonomy of the self, really only applies to a small and very privileged group of people. And that what we're really talking about, instead of saying freedom, we should be saying power. One's power to live their life as they see fit. And when you see things as power, you realize that concepts like one overarching organization with monopoly on the use of force and an economic system that concentrates the economic power of the riches of this world in the hands of very, very few people, uh, most of us are not able to enjoy any form of autonomy, whether it be because you're spending over half your income on rent or because patriarchy is still a thing or because of racism or because you live in the global south and to keep my level of comfort happy, we have to take all your I mean, heck, there was a military coup in Bolivia, like not even three days ago at the time of recording. And so, uh, yeah, freedom and hierarchy are uh, incompatible ideas. And so as we go forward in this series, when we talk about the people who started the United States and the ideas that built the United States, we're talking about freedom in the sense of a highly hierarchical society and limited to a very small class of people. And I know that that's a blasphemous thing to say to some circles. I know that when I was a kid, I have always been a big fan of US history. I've seen a lot of the United States in my life. And when I started seeing the cracks in the American dream and the ideals that the United States being hollow and a preface for a long history of oppression, it was quite shocking to me. And uh, yeah, when you try to unwhitewash American history, you can't help but feel sad and a little dirty. All I can say is, well, I don't think ignorance is bliss and you can learn along with us. And who knows, maybe if a few more of us learn this stuff, will be able to make a change. And so getting back to the story, when the Europeans arrive in the Americas, they're going to be saying that they're spreading freedom to this continent, both to the European settlers who go there and to the indigenous people. I hope after the discussion we've had, that idea of spreading freedom to the Americas has a completely different connotation. And the story of that spreading of freedom will be a predominant narrative in the early history of the United States. So buckle down, things are gonna get brutal.
So yeah, I decided to revamp the Step Back US History series. It's gonna go for a very, very, very long time. And if you liked it, I would suggest that you take this video, maybe watch the first one in the series I did back in 2018. Watch that and you know get yourself up to date. And then I would like you to share this video with other people. One of the things I'm doing with this series is that I want to follow roughly, although on a very, very long scale, the curriculum of the US AP history course so that people searching up for homework answers can de-whitewash their own past. So yeah, if you know any students or if you know any friends who have a whitewashed idea of American history, please send them this or the first episode in this series and uh, I hope that you have a really good time as we go through this together. And of course, this video would not be possible if it wasn't for my wonderful patrons here. If you want to help make more videos like this happen and, you know, keep the cats fed and the rent paid, then go to patreon.com slash stepbackhistory and uh, give us as little as a dollar a month. They got to see this video early. You can see the next one early if you'd like. Anyways, hang tight. See you guys next time for more Step Back.